Sheila Eddy, how do you plead to the offense of murder in the first degree of the felony charged in count three of the indictment in this case? Guilty. The record will reflect that the defendant has entered a plea of guilty to the offense of murder in the first degree of the felony charged in count three of the indictment in this case. You may be seated. Watch the chair, please. Well, what would the state have expected to prove in this case if it had gone to trial? Your Honor, on the night of July 5th and 6th, 2012, Skylar Niece disappeared and was never seen alive again. At a trial, the state's evidence would prove that Skylar's disappearance and death were the result of a conspiracy between Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff to rid themselves of their friend Skylar by killing her. They achieved their goal by planning to pick up Skylar from her residence after her day of evening of work had been completed. They planned to drive around, socialize some, and then stop at a location to smoke dope. Their scheme was to hide knives on their bodies and to attack Skylar at an agreed upon moment. They even prepared by bringing a shovel with them to bury Schuyler's body. Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff carried out that plan. Together they stabbed and killed Schuyler and left her body to nature. Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff carried out that plan in conspiracy with each other and finalized that plan. As I have said, that would be our evidence, and that evidence in conjunction with Rachel Schoff's evidence at trial regarding those events uh, would combine with physical evidence to include Sheila Eddy's car, the vehicle that was used to transport Schuyler that night, having the DNA of Schuyler niece in the form of blood on a part of the trunk of that car. We have also recently received a report from the FBI laboratory that shows that a vertebrae of Schuyler that was collected from the scene of the murder shows evidence of injury that is consistent with having been caused by a knife blade. So with the physical evidence, the testimony of a co-defendant and other testimony that would be part of, of a full trial, we believe that a jury would find beyond any reasonable doubt that this defendant is guilty as she has been indicted. Thank you. Ms. Eddie, have you heard what the prosecutor said the state's evidence would be? Yes, sir. Is that substantially correct? Yes, sir. Is that what happened? Yes, sir. Ms. Eddy, are you entering a plea of guilty to the offense of murder in the first degree, the felony charged in count three of this indictment, because you are, in fact, guilty of this offense? Yes, sir. Mr. Benninger, before I accept your client's guilty plea, having consulted with your client, having investigated the case, and having heard the representations of the state with respect to its evidence, can you see any advantage to your client if this case proceeded to trial? No. The reason for that, my conclusion, is based upon my investigation, which has coextended with the full and complete discovery that we have requested and which we have been provided by the state, the federal government through the FBI, and the authorities in Pennsylvania who recovered and held the body and the remains of uh, Skylar Neese. I have examined the law the entire scope of the law here in West Virginia under federal law and under the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to attempt to find a reasonable defense in law for my client. I have found none. I have looked at all the evidence. As the court's aware, we filed a number of pretrial motions, one or more of which was to suppress certain aspects of the state's case. Um, we have thoughtfully, carefully, and in unison with 
with Sheila Eddy and her family have evaluated every piece of paper, literally every piece of paper, every video, every audio recording provided to us in discovery, in pretrial proceedings. And I have found negligible, if any, factual basis upon which to develop a defense in this murder and conspiracy case. So with that, uh, the court is prepared to proceed to sentencing. Uh, Mr. Benninger, anything that you wish to offer by way of testimony, proffer, or statement before sentencing in this matter? Yes, Your Honor, briefly. Okay, proceed. On behalf of Sheila Addy and in her right of allocution, I would state that while clearly understood by the court, the prosecuting attorney's office and law enforcement, the silence which has surrounded these proceedings and our work in them should not be construed by the Nice family or any member of our community as a sign or expression of disrespect or as a sign of lack of remorse by Sheila Addy and any member of her family or as a sign of any lack of concern, worry, or caring by Sheila Addy or any member of her family resulting from Schuyler's death. <coughs> The silence which has shrouded these proceedings was caused and insisted upon by me so that the work we, we needed to do on the defense was to preserve the integrity of the proceedings, the rights of Sheila Eddy, the rights of Rachel Schoff, and most importantly, the rights of Skylar Neese and her family so they could be protected without interference from the press, public opinion, or the statements and expressions made on the internet and in social media, which have been numerous. Now that we have come to this place in time in the proceeding, I can state without hesitation or reservation that all concerned must know and understand that Sheila Eddy, my client, and her family recognize that the Nice family is in a constant state of despair, loneliness, and sadness as a result of Skyler's death. For that, Sheila Eddy and her family are and will be eternally sorry. These proceedings are now coming to a close. With this conclusion, we hope that all families, the Nice family, most importantly, the Eddy family, and the Show family, all tragically affected by the actions of Sheila and Rachel, resulting in Schuyler's death, can move forward in a more peaceful and hopeful way. Ms. Eddy, at this time, I would advise you of your right to allocution. Uh, that is your right to make any statement that you might wish the court to consider before it passes sentence in this matter. Uh, do you have anything that you wish to say at this time? Your Honor, I can, on behalf of my client, she uh, asked that she be permitted to remain silent. Skyler's aunt, Mary, needs a sister. And, um, you know, what? I don't know what in the world would ever make somebody feel the need to have to kill someone in this world over anything. Nothing could be that tragedy that you couldn't work out without having to kill them. She's taken the hopes and dreams from my sister from the prom to graduation to being a grandmother and planning a wedding. She'll never have any of this. And she's tore so many families apart that everything she gets coming to her, I feel, is, is due to her. She tr came and she acted as if she knew nothing. She pretended like she was her friend and stayed and comforted us and swore she had no idea what was going on and the whole time she knew. And to sit there and look at us and tell us she knew nothing and now come to this day, and she admits that she did, just shows how evil she can be. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. And again, sir, if you would just please identify yourself for the record, then you may speak. My name is David Neese. I'm Scholar's father. Um, I'm here today with my wife, Mary. I speak to you on, on the behalf of my daughter because she can't be here. On July 6th, she made a decision to leave her house and go through a window and 
supposedly go with two friends, and I use that term. I'm sure you know what I mean. When we learned that she was missing, we immediately went to the Star City Police who couldn't do anything with us, so they uh, just listed her as a runaway. Since that date, my life, my wife's life has dressed. Look drastically altered. We are no longer a family. The person sitting before you, Scott, our so-called friend, took her away from us without any remorse or feelings. You can look into the eyes of those who are responsible, but you can never hear what they heard as they were taking her life. You can see the faces of the killer, but you can't see Scott's face. You can never understand the fear that she must have had as they took a knife and ended her life. You cannot imagine the pain that Scott must have felt and the pain that Mary and I now feel. Your Honor, it's not a to be hurt today. As I've said, and as you've heard um, very painfully from Mr. Neese, um, on the night of July 5th and 6th, 2012, Skylar Neese disappeared forever. It became known that Skylar had last been in the company of her two best friends. One of them, Sheila Eddy, had been friends with Skylar since grade school. The other, Rachel Shoff, was a friend of more recent vintage. The investigation after that by police covered much ground in varying theories as to why Skylar had disappeared and how and when she might be found. Because Sheila Eddy and Rachel Shoff were known to have been with Skylar on the night of July 5th, 2012, they were questioned by police a number of times during the ensuing months. They repeatedly claimed to have left Skylar at a location near her home and repeatedly disclaimed any further contact with her. Their agreed upon story held up until late 2012 when Rachel Schoff's story added a piece that Sheila Eddy's story had not caught up with yet. Skylar's remains and mind you, not her body, but remains, were finally recovered in mid-January 2013. The reason for that was that on July or January 3rd, 2013, Rachel Show finally agreed, after securing her own benefits, to tell the truth about Skylar's demise. She also drove with police on that date to show where Sheila Eddy and she had left Schuyler's body that night in July. The truth that Rachel Schoff disclosed about this horrific and vile crime included these things. Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff had begun to distance themselves from Schuyler. They had begun to fear that their friendship would dissolve. And if that were to happen, <coughs> Sheila and Rachel worried that Skylar would divulge their secrets, the kind of secrets perhaps that girls have, uh, and other things. The conflict grew between them over time, or at least in the minds of Rachel and Sheila. And during that time, Sheila and Rachel discussed methods of getting rid of Skylar. And then came the summer of 2012, after Sheila returned from a week at the beach in June of 2012, when Skylar had accompanied Sheila's family, Sheila told Rachel of her continual quarreling with Skylar during that trip at the beach. And the desire between Rachel and Sheila to rid themselves of Skylar intensified. So they made a plan to pick up Skylar after her work on July 5th, 2012, and to kill her. To carry out this plan, they armed themselves with kitchen knives concealed beneath their clothing. And they brought a shovel and clean clothing for themselves for when they were finished. After they picked up Skylar, they drove to a lo location with which they were familiar from prior times of driving around and smoking marijuana. 
after the three girls were all outside of the car at an agreed upon signal, a countdown actually, those two girls, Sheila and Rachel, both stabbed Skylar to death. They stabbed her multiple times. Skylar fought back and attempted to run, but she was overcome by her attackers. They stood over her until her last breath. Sheila, Eddie, and Rachel Schoff tried to bury Skylar, but they couldn't dig into the hard earth at that time. So they left her body and tried to cover it up with tree branches and other natural d debris that was around the site. They changed to clean, unbloody clothing and returned to their lives. These murderers, however, must now pay a price for their depraved actions. Today, we ask you to sentence Sheila Eddy to life in prison, acknowledging that under our law and under this plea agreement, she will become parole eligible. But we are asking you today, Your Honor, here today, to sentence this defendant to adult prison for her very adult crime. And we're asking that she not be returned to juvenile services custody, as is a prerogative of the court. I would remind you that if Sheila Eddy is now 18, she is no longer an actual juvenile, an actual underage offender. If she were to have committed a crime now at the age of 18 years, a crime of murder or even a lesser crime, she would go to adult jail and eventually adult prison. And that's what we're asking for today. Nothing, Your Honor, except that I ask that you exercise your discretion uh, in face of the request of the state that she be remanded to the adult jurisdiction of the Division of Corrections, that she be given the period of at least one month time period within which to remain in juvenile services custody before being transferred uh, to adult jurisdiction. That's my only request. A period of a very short period of one month. Um, obviously, you have the discretion to recommend uh, a period until she's 21, um, but I believe the period of one month would give an appropriate time for humane adjustment to the eventual transfer to that um, system. Very well. Ms. Eddy, would you please stand? Sheila Eddy, for your conviction of the offense of murder in the first degree upon your plea of guilty, it is the sentence of the court that you've been imprisoned in the West Virginia State Penitentiary for the rest of your natural life, consistent with the requirements of the Constitution of the United States. That sentence is technically with mercy, which makes you eligible for parole after you have served 15 years. With respect to placement, it is the court's intention that the defendant be placed in the custody of the Department of Corrections as soon as a bed is available in a Department of Corrections facility. Just so everybody understands, it is the court's position that the defendant is not to be transferred into the regional jail system awaiting a bed at a Department of Corrections facility. Um, primarily because of the overcrowding that exists in the regional jail system. I think things are a little bit better in the juvenile side of house until there's a bed available. So it is, of course, intention that you go into Department of Corrections custody as soon as there is a bed available in Department of Corrections. And I mean, if that's tomorrow, that's tomorrow. If it's 30 days from now, it's 30 days from now, or whatever it is. Until then, she'll remain in the juvenile facility. To reveal and the court to know that under the terms of my retention as Ms. Sheila Eddy's counsel, I will remain her count counsel for all post-conviction matters um, into the foreseeable future. Very well. 
I appreciate that. Thank you. That concludes the hearing. All rise. Courts in recess. Please be seated.